Record to the cloud. Good. Uh, this is the a Rex pop-up call on Friday, July 6th, 2018. We are talking about what to do now. What should we do? And uh, uh, that should become a little more evident as we dive into the topic. Uh, the poem I've found to take us in is titled One of the Monkeys by Nicholas Johnson. And it runs as follows. I'm one of the monkeys they've got typing in a room full of monkeys. It's a play Shakespeare wrote back in the old days they want us to write again. So we're writing a play we never read. <clears throat> they keep inviting strangers to watch us and the strangers say, they wrote to be or nutty to be. Uh, they stay too long if we write something exciting but the bananas flow like wine. We know it's a crazy morbid ranting play, a stew full of murder love, but with a noble feel. Shocked, I see hack monkeys come and monkeys go, one keeper killed my father. What should I do? I'm watching him. My teeth are sharp as steel. What the hell was that, Jerry? <laughs> what would you do? What is going on here? Well, I, there's a way to set the tone of the melee. I know. I'm gonna, hey, April, I'm going to read the poem again. It's uh, One of the Monkeys by Nicholas Johnson. I'm one of the monkeys they've got typing in a room full of monkeys. It's a play Shakespeare wrote back in the old days. They want us to write again. So we're writing a play we never read. They keep inviting strangers to watch us, and the strangers say, they wrote to be or nutty to be. They stay too long if we write something exciting, but then bananas flow like wine. We know it's a crazy, morbid, ranting play, a stew full of murder, love, but with a noble feel. Shocked, I see hack monkeys come and monkeys go. But one keeper killed my father. What should I do? I'm watching him. My teeth are sharp as steel. Monkeys at a typewriter from their point of view. <laughs> so unfolds our life. Maybe that's, that's the true God of the universe we're living in right now. That or mice, Lucky according up. to Douglas Adams. I, I rank or something. I, I, I have said more than once that whoever wrote the script uh, really should be a lot more original than they are. Um, I mean, I, there are so many tells to this story. For example, it starts with a wiener, right? <laughs> and then it turns out that guy, some guy named Pecker actually has all of the dirt. He is control the guy who's the editor of the National Inquirer. Inquirer. Pecker, right? right? I mean, come on. Couldn't we have slightly more original names, at least? Well, Tom, Tom Wolf would feel embarrassed about this. It's terrible. It's, it's, like, it's, it's like some B-level <laughs> script, and, and somehow we got sucked into it. So are you embarrassed to be found in this plot? I, I just think the plot should have a lot more originality. Okay. Yeah, I want to live a better, richer life than this. <laughs> <laughs> may, may it not be handed over to Borges for the interim because it's just going to get worse. No oh, good. Um, That's a great so, point. So who, who would like to put an initial stake in the sand about what to do, what should be done? Because who, fe who feels relatively strongly about uh, where we are and which direction things are headed and whether stepping out, stepping in, stepping across, uh, stepping out, any of those prepositions are each different strategy proposals, right? Um, which one? Mika, you're, I mean, you've been, you've been, I, I can, I, can, I can rant about this for a while if, it, if it's helpful to you. Um, but I don't have a particularly satisfying answer um, because, I mean, I feel like we are, uh, you know, we are like these tiny little boats on being carried by a wave that has been building for a long time. Um, and I'd like to stay afloat I'd like, you know, to have my, you know, other, other good people in the boat with me, <laughs> you know, I want us to survive, but I don't know if there's really that much we can do to alter the large, you know, like the tectonic level 
forces that created these waves and that worrying about that feels unproductive. Like I, I, I you know, I, I think a lot about my, um, our parents' generation. My mother was, as a child, uh, uh, her family had to go into hiding in Belgium when the Nazis occupied uh, the country and she was separated from her parents and she was with her sister and, and for a number of years they were in hiding and luckily they all survived. Um, and that, you know, they've lived, that she lived through worse than whatever we're in the middle of right now. Not that I'm suggesting that uh, it could get worse here too. But, um, you know, there's, you need to have some perspective that the moment we're in right now with our government willfully breaking up families and harming little children for no other reason that they were trying to have a better life by coming here is, it's, it's obscene, but it, it's still not nearly as obscene as what my mother went through. Mm -hmm. um, it's getting and there. Mika's mother, by the way, is a delightful human being. Oh, I, that's right. She met you at PDF. <laughs> I hung out with her for a while at the end of PDF. It was really, really, really nice. That's right. She, she mentioned she enjoyed talking with you. Yeah. Um, I also think that we're, you know, like we like to plan for future contingencies and some of the future contingencies that I think we all sense are possible are frighteningly divergent, right? Like, um, discontinuous with the present it would, would be the way I would describe it. In other words, six months from now, we could be in chaos because a whole set of people decide, yeah, we're going to really fuck the American 2018 elections. And, and instead of going through a normal, quote, election cycle, we'll go through something that we don't recognize and don't accept. And then what? Um, what are the odds of that? How do you prepare for that? What, it, what the hell do you do? Um, it's all very disconcerting. And it makes it very, very hard to find the best way through. Um, I've been saying to people for a while now that it, you know, we're in a deep hole and it takes a while to get out of that hole. You, you know, it took us a lot of time to get where we are in the mess that we're in. So we don't get out of it fast. There are no shortcuts. Um, and if I had, had, you know, I guess Michael Pollan has, um, you know, what was his like six word aphorism about like, you know, eat locally, eat less meat, you know, whatever. He had like six words. I can't remember what they are. Eat food, mostly plants, not too much. Thank you. The new ones, and, uh, take and drugs, not too often. Take drugs, not too often. <laughs> In small doses. Small doses, yeah. Uh, okay. And, and so like my only answer on this to, you know, I have like one piece of it, which is I think whatever we do, we need to build more local community. That, um, that part of why the good people, whatever, whoever we are, uh, got as weak as we are politically is because we're not connected up locally. Um, and that the the organized, the, the power in America is always a contest between organized money and organized people. And for the most part, the people are not very organized. And there's a lot of organized people in things like evangelical churches and gun clubs. Um, thus, they have more power than they would have numerically. They're just well organized. Um, and people who believe in I don't know, climate change or whatever, are numerically, we may be bigger in the polls, but we're just not locally organized. So we have much less power. And the system reflects that. Um, so my only advice is whatever you're doing, if it doesn't include a lot of building up of local, meaningful, ongoing community engagement around whatever the issues are that you think you should be engaging on, you're not helping. We need, we need to get more people together in more places. And that's the only silver lining of the last two, 18 months is that it is happening, that millions of people have decided there is nobody else here but us and that what they have to do is get together. 
And that's what the indivisible groups are doing in lots of places and the women's march huddles and the et cetera. And I think that there's a, there's some hope in that. I thought things would be a lot worse by now compared to where they are because of that response. So I don't know if that if that helps at all, but that's, you, yeah, that was really good. Thank you. It's a good start. Uh, is is that the only silver lining of this weird ass moment? Are you asking me? Uh, or, everybody, everybody. Yeah, uh, maybe. So let someone else jump in. Yeah. Anybody else? So I, I'll I'll restate something I think I've said on the call before, which is that uh, the week after the election happened. I realized only in retrospect that I had set aside all my wishes for, for the redesign of institutions and our whole world from trust. I had set them unconsciously aside in order to vote for the first woman president of the United States. And that I had little expectation or hope that she would actually tip at the windmills of the existing bureaucracies, the, the big institutions, the different things, that she would be a really good care, an overqualified caretaker of the status quo. And that made me sad. But it made me realize that despite this feeling of a little bit of schadenfreude, um, that the, the, the shaking up or shattering of a lot of institutions, I'm not completely against. I think that it opens up the cracks through which the light can shine. Uh, it's also damaging a lot of people along the way, so I don't want to take that lightly. Um, but I think that we need to redesign a lot of things, a whole lot of things, and we weren't going to get that moment or that opportunity um, unless some things got opened up. And so weirdly, bizarrely, for me, one of the silver linings is um, if the people breaking things don't have a great plan B, then maybe other people with good plans and good ideas that come in uh, can actually put some roots into the sidewalks and do something interesting that picks up energy and gets moving. Yeah, I, I, I buy that silver lining too. Um, but I you know, having just tried to be an optimist, I, I just would add that it's also possible that, um, you know, the, 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 the amount of breakage we're experiencing is, while it opens up room for productive and positive experiments, it also opens up some really horrible things too. And we could go further down the, you know, this, the downward spiral before we, we, uh, Coming yeah. out the other end, um, uh, you know the, the, these weird uh, uh, coalitions of outsiders um, that we seem to be getting of everybody who wants to, you know, like the as you put it, the caretakers versus the insurrectionists, or they, you know, the institutionalists versus the insurrectionists. I think is how some people put it. Yeah, Ethan uh, Zuckerman. I mean, there are there are important reasons why the post-war institutions got built, right? Yes. <laughs> you know, oh, and I and, were sort of talking about that before y'all showed up. Okay. Uh, I mean, like, and the thing is, is that the current generation, the, the, the statistic that scares me the most is this chart that shows declining support for the statement that it's important to live in a democracy and that the, the, in a number of Western industrialized countries, the support for that statement is lowest among people age 30 and below. So people 60 and above get it. They're like, yeah, they remember what Nazism was and what fascism was and, and that there have to be these kinds of checks on xenophobia and, and, and the younger generation just looks at democracy and goes, it's not working. Look at all that gridlock. There's gotta be something better. I'm really glad you brought this up, Mika, because you know, if, if you, pay attention to international news. Okay, you've got Turkey, you've got Poland, and you've got a right wing in France, you have Italy. I mean, it's the West, this is happening to all of us. It's, it, it really is like the 1930s. It's happening to all of us. Now, and I was wondering the other day, like I tended to, I have to, to I've tended to think about uh, all this stuff that's happened is that the working class in America who really lost, the white working class who lost position and power and money and jobs because of you know globalism okay but then wait a minute every segment of whites voted for these people and i'm like oh maybe it's 0708 
and the way it affected the whole world. And I'm just throwing it, and, and I don't know if it's useful for us to go down and speculate about this stuff, but I think we need to realize this is a broad based phenomenon that's not just happening here. We've got Brexit in the UK, for example. I mean, and it's seemingly like it's taking over the West right now. It's funny because the, one of the lessons of history is that we often don't reach back far enough for good lessons to history. We usually reach back to the first handy example, and it's often not that great uh, an analogy to the current situation. So right now, a lot of people are reaching back to fascism and Nazi, Nazi Germany, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm not, I don't have a better moment in history to suggest. Uh, but I think that, like, it's weird because the institutions we built after World War II were pretty reasonable and got us someplace. The institutions we built after World War I were yeah. horrible and basically caused World War II, right? The, the, the remedies, the, the damages, the, every, the reparations, all that kind of stuff basically took us into the Great Depression, took us into World War II. After World War II, maybe that's a whole different set of institutions. And some of them are probably timed out. And I don't know that we're really looking at them and thinking, okay, which ones, which ones do we improve? How do we improve them? What do we do? But I also think this general conversation about the more macro scale change is good for informing us about what to do now, right? Because partly, it's, should we devote some of our brain cycles to the, the insurrectionist point of view about how do we change some of these current institutions? What's a good way to go about it? Uh, another one is, do we just step out and go do good things? I mean, one of the things that was so heartening, Mika, when uh, you and I were briefly, you were you stayed through most of a two-day workshop that the B-Taiwan people ran the Monday, Tuesday after Personal Democracy Forum. And I was there for a little bit of it, but these people are building uh, electronic platforms that support democracy and actual discourse uh, among citizens of a nation. And they're trying to figure out how it works and they're trying to train other countries in how to use it. And they're kind of ignoring the, the, the hurricane that's just outside the door. Uh, and, and doing really interesting work. That, that's the equal and opposite reaction theory. Is that, you know, the other things that, you know, we, you would expect to be the antithesis of what we're observing is, is a natural occurrence. You know, people will do that. Well, I'm glad somebody is. There's definitely two. Uh, your world changed locally um, given the last couple of years? And, and how much has your attitude about what your own priorities are changed in that period? Well, one thing I would observe having, you know, uh, April travels more than anybody that I know, but uh, for the little bit of travel that I've done and the people I talk to around, is that we're clearly moving back into a multinational uh, modality as opposed to a global one. Right, and that means still connected, but not homogenized. Okay, which is you know, kind of uh, one of the things that I think people are reacting uh, to is um, I don't want to be um, just put into the blender and considered to just be you know only human. You know, I want to be human plus whatever the narrative is that connects me to, you know, local or tribal or, you know, you know, what I'm part of, you know, temporally, right? Um, and I don't have some of the same feelings that other folks, because I'm adopted, so I don't have that, um, that, that deep sense of, you know, lineage uh, that the others have. But the point is that, that seems to be happening pretty much across the board is that we're moving into that multinational modality. And so how do you connect the multinational as opposed to the global narrative, which I think is kind of getting rejected? Kevin, I think you have a good point. I'd like to repeat back to make sure I understood it. So, so sure. you have in, in Europe, you have all this, this anger at the EU bureaucrats in Brussels. Is right. that like what you're talking about? Well, I mean, to the degree that Brussels represents the usurper of That's what my identity okay. right? mm -hmm. or, or my, uh, my, my, my cultural heritage, right? You know, that, you know, you have to be like, you know, the, I, I'm, I'm reminded of, I'm trying to remember, it was Kurt Vonnegut 
that wrote, you know, Welcome to the Monkey House, and that everybody was going to be handicapped down to the lowest common denominator to achieve equality, right? And that, you know, um, do we really want to be, you know, handicapped that way um, and, and put into the blender? Uh, Mike, and you're in Brexit land. What, uh, what's going on in your brain? Really interesting here. For one, one thing about the, uh, we'll ignore for the moment. We can barely hear you. Sorry, your volume is very low. No? Speak, speak some more. Your volume, for some reason, is very low. Let me just check on my sound. Here. Is that any better? A little better. Yes. Okay. Um, so Brexit. Well, for, first of all, let me say. I, I think the, the first thing you have to do looking at this is to ignore facts and logic and reason <laughs> because it's got absolutely nothing to do with it. Right. If you look at this, if you actually look at the real political structure of the EU, it is, it is profoundly democratic and profoundly representative. For example, there is no law made in the EU which can actually affect the UK unless it's ratified by the UK Parliament. Okay. Everybody gets to vote on what those laws are going to be, and they, and, it, and they happen by common agreement. So the facts have nothing to do with it. Mm -hmm. However, I do think that I do think that Kevin's put his finger on something which is really important, and one of the things the United Nations failed to do, and one of the things that the EU has failed to do, is to deal with the problem of fractal scaling. So that you can actually have a proper local representation and local identity and, and still be able to cope with the things which now require global participation, like global warming, etc. There is no structure, there is no suggested structure for, for which is credible for how that can happen, as far as I know. There, there may be, but even if there was. I do think that the other aspect of this is that you have got a whole bunch of people out there who are doing everything they can, right, to deliberately focus everybody's attention on the primitive brain, as I would call it, on the lower brain completely. Because they know that if they can get everyone focused on their lower brain, then they can control them really easily. So I think our, our biggest battle right now, the, the biggest difficulty, the biggest thing to solve is actually, is, seems to me to actually be around how do we deal with those poisonous and poisoned narratives which are so simple and so attractive. When I, was, I remember when I was growing up as a kid and I was saying, I was, my sister I was talking to is super smart. She's older than me too, so of course she was always super smart. I, I, said to, I said to her, you know, well, why, how, on earth did, how on earth did the Germans, the Nazis, end up doing this? And she said, well, I mean, there are probably lots of different reasons. One of the reasons is that if you take a lot of frustrated and pissed off people and you offer them the opportunity of gaining something through destruction rather than construction, they'll take it because destruction takes five minutes. Construction takes a long time, a lot of effort, thought and caring and commitment. There's a few thoughts. Um, Mike, could you say just a little bit more about what you, what you mean by fractal scaling? Because I think that's really interesting. And uh, then I'd love to pass the mic to April if she'd like to jump in, because she's been doing a lot of thinking on a piece of these, of these topics. I'm actually thinking, I was actually thinking of Stafford Beer, because uh, one of the things I've been doing for, is doing all these interviews not around organizational design, right? And around holacracy and stuff like that. Uh, and I think. One of the things which seems to me really great about Beer, basically, is that he looked at the constitution of the human nervous system in the brain and said, Let, why don't we create an organization like that? How about we do some biomimicry? Because, hey, guess what? Nature's been at this for a few billion years. Maybe it's got some pretty good insights and ideas. So the whole of the viable systems model is based on the human nervous system and the brain, and it mm -hmm. gives you a fractal scaling of uh, responsibility and action. But the interesting thing is that if you get it right with fractal scaling, 
the fractal distribution, then what happens is you get the synthesizing, you get the synthesizing entities that you need without the super attractive to psychopath pinch points of massive power and money being accumulated in particular nodes. Right. Big, big budgets and pyramidal structures are choke points and honeypots. And they, 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 they really are dysfunctional to the solution of what are mostly distributed problems. So I, I totally, and then, and we've been building very large institutions with pretty centralized structures so over and over and over. And, and yes, handing to them the responsibility to fix a lot of these problems where the responsibility should lie with us a lot. Right. Yeah, I agree. And locally. Yeah. yeah. April, would you like to jump in? Um, just briefly. So I like this conversation a lot. And I think where I'm getting, it's not that I'm tripping up, it's that where my head is and what I'm, where I can't get from here to there. And in fairness, I totally get, as I shared in the chat early on, like, I want to focus on what do we do today. However, from where I sit and travels and like having spent the last three months most uh, largely also in a cocoon really thinking about some of these issues or at least this nexus, it is very, very easy to me to see the pieces coming you know, on the one hand, the pieces fraying and disaggregating. And then on the other hand, sort of like an organic cell, you know, things are dividing and coming together all the time. Um, and I guess going back, Kevin, I agree with you to some degree, but I would actually, I don't disagree with you, but from where I see it is that we actually see ultimately, although you would really have a strong case to be like going on today's observations, I don't see where I'm, where, where I'm coming from from saying this. Ultimately, I really think that the nation state layer, the state centric, geopolitical boundaries that we've drill, drawn on the globe today, mm -hmm. I really believe that's going to be gutted. Now, maybe not in our lifetimes, but that whole middle layer is just dissolving. And the backlash we see with nationalism is because people are like, holy shit, that's happening. We have to scramble back to what we know and fight for it even harder. I think that ultimately that, that loses, that you might win a battle and you're gonna lose the war big time. And meanwhile, what we're looking at though, to build on Mika and Mike, is this two layered global, much, much more global. And it's very easy for me theoretically to get my head around what a global kind of community that might have some aspect of governance or self-governance in it is, and then much, much more local. So figuratively, I think in the future, I'm going to have a passport that's related to a city. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm with you there, April. And it's going to have a global identity, but that middle band just goes away. And all the shit, we're, not all of it, but a lot of the shit we're seeing today is a recognition, like a subconscious recognition that that's happening, but an utter freaking out that this may be happening. So fight till we can to, to you know, protect it and go deeper in it. I think it becomes a lot more Kevin, like you, um, it's all wait. Singapore, right? Is that every node, like being in New York or Silicon Valley, is it's it's a place, it's a nation state, it's an identity, it's a culture, right? And you're going to join up with that it, and and want to be you know part of that, and they get connected, right? But Miha, I, like your question is exactly mine. Like I see that we're, and I can even, I think, I don't know that I would have been able to do this, certainly not a year ago, but as I've been really thinking about this um, hard because obviously I'm interested in this from the perspective of things like human rights and families belong together and all of that. But I'm also interested in terms of what does this mean for the future of work, talent mobility, governance, rethinking, go obviously government. But like there's a whole lot of really good opportunity breaking down some of these barriers that have been in place for so long. Um, and I don't mean to be shortchanging the, the, the pain, like all of the, just the absolute minefield that exists between here and there. But I can, 
I can see the breadcrumbs as to, in a way, how we get from here to there. But what's interesting is that, Mika, it's happening against this context, with this backdrop, which you laid out really well at the beginning, which is we don't know. I feel like it's a giant decision tree every day, and we don't know what's going to happen three or six months from now. My, my strong suspicion is that the ultimate outcome is still the same of this gutting of the middle layer. But whether this requires, I mean, it's a really bad analogy, but it's like backing out a car. Jerry knows I'm not great at it. Like, is this going to be a three point turn or a five point turn? Are we going to get it the first time? I don't know. And that's what's just, it just feels like we're being whipsawed every day. Um, so it, it's hard to, it's hard to get, but I, I still see, it's hard for me to imagine a future just given the, the macro forces at play and obviously technology um, that, 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 that this train hasn't, you know, it's left the station, it's picking up momentum, that it doesn't somehow just completely derail. Anyway, too many analogies. Let me just go quiet there. Thanks, Jerry. No, it's really good, really good stuff. And, and the, the things that Mike was talking about a moment ago uh, about the design of institutions from this sort of fractal distributed matter and a lot of Stafford Beer's research and others uh, and the viable system model and all that are actually intellectual underpinnings for the things that may well survive this epoch and be the ways that we, that we steer and guide what, you know, with one another uh, in the future. I think there's a, there's a lot of wisdom in those, those kinds of things. Um, uh, let's go pragmatic for a second. Like, should, you know, uh, are, are we considering going and campaigning for somebody during the midterms? Like Dave, you had a bunch of, uh, of really like, what do I do tomorrow and where, where do I lean so that um, uh, my life energy, I'm putting your, my words in your mouth, but so that, so that my life energy is not wasted in this next cycle. Yeah, I mean, I, I was kind of thinking about what Mika was saying because I, I take the point that, you know, we have been through worse points in our lives, but I, I was a little bit, I mean, one of the things I was playing over in my head was this image about, you know, the Germans in, you know, 32 or something like that. And they're sitting there and they're watching this stuff happen and they're kind of going, wow, what's going on? You know, and, and I'm wondering like, Jesus, is that what I'm doing right now? It's like, I'm just watching it come and then I'm going to go, oh, fuck. You know, so, it, so there is that, and there's a fear, I think, I think of that. Um, and then anyway, the flip side is I think they're probably just, again, as you guys have gone through, there, there really is this breaking open and there's all these kinds of opportunity for, I think, really positive kinds of transition. I, I guess I find the fear probably a little bit more motivating. Um, Mika, jump in. Uh, yeah, yeah, sorry, I'm, I, I think I'm okay now. Yeah. I, the, the one thing about the Germans in 1932, I mean, uh, I spend a lot of time thinking about that period. Um, and I'm in the middle of reading a, a pretty interesting book right now about how the Nazis took over one town. Um, but uh, there's this comment at one point, which is that a lot of Germans would not have supported the Nazis if they knew what the Nazis were going to do. Um, that that in the in the political battle between the Nazi Party, the Communists, the Social Democrats, the other Christian and nationalist parties that you know made up the Weimar Republic, um, yeah, I mean Hitler was violent and racist, but the there was a great deal of support for the the Nazis because they were just dynamic because they 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 showed energy at a time when the established parties didn't um, and not necessarily that the energy was and we're going to round up millions of people and kill them be, just because of who they are. Um, so there's something to be said for the dynamism, you know, that the, this is a moment to be pushing like the Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez who was just, you know, beat a establishment Democrat in the primary and demonstrated, you know, something very interesting, which is this is a moment where new leadership can step in fairly quickly um, and capture attention and inspire and perhaps give people the sense that other there are other directions possible. Mm -hmm. That's good. Um, and it, it has been a moment in, in Europe uh, also where you see a lot of these new political parties, Podemos, Syriza in, in Greece, um, one of the things that's worrisome about it is when these parties start making weird alliances with the far right because they're also anti-establishment. Um, and that is creepy. And that seems to be what's happening in Italy. And that seems to be 
what hap- has just happened in Greece as well. Um, uh, but yeah, we're all we're all you know trying to figure out where things are headed, and we have, as you said, Jerry, we have very poor analytical tools mm-hmm. for for understanding. Uh, Go ahead, which may, which may make us actually see things less clearly. Yeah, Mika, I think your point about like the energeticness of Trumpism or, is really an important point. And this morning, I just want to share this. Uh, you know, I'm a finance person, and like that's my hobby. That's, that's what I've studied my whole life. So I usually just read the Financial Times and the Economist and stuff. But this morning, I actually turned on CNBC just to listen to it. Now, most of the journalists, I actually sort of like financial press journalists because that means they have economics degrees, political economy degrees. I usually am not offended by their stupidity, okay? And so I was listening to people I've known and I've heard for years saying things like, well, yeah, we know tariffs don't work out, but, you know, maybe Trump's doing something that's going to work. I was hearing excuses from educated people who, you know, if we, we would be terrified about this happening when the Democrats did it, and they were just going along, well, maybe our powerful leader can do this. And I was, I was unbelievable. I was like, no. <laughs> it, so, and that's what they're counting on me, because your little point there, not little point, I think it's a big point, of, hey, we're shaking things up. There's a motion here. You know, I, I heard that today in CNBC. I was shocked. Interesting. Um, in the spirit of the topic of our call, and also because we've been treading on Godwin territory here about Nazism and all that, I just want to go back and offer a couple, a couple of, of thoughts on, on that part of it. Um, first, my mother is alive because her parents got fled Germany in 1939 uh, in one of, on one of the last steamships out of Hamburg. Uh, my grand, I have a, a story I'll tell some other time about my grandfather and Kristallnacht, uh, because I think Kristallnacht uh, in 1938, November, uh, was basically the sign that they had to get out of Dodge, that that was like the sign that things were like gone and done and crap. Um, Alice Miller, the Swiss psychotherapist, wrote a bunch of really good analyses about why Germany was ready for Hitler. And she talks about what's called poisonous pedagogy. Uh, the German education system was like the Prussian military education system, which we then later imported and inherited actually around that time. Um, but she basically says that Germans were ready, they were more obedient than your average population and ready for somebody who came along and said, make us great again in that particular way. So, so that, that's kind of interesting because we're not, we're not in that particular phase. We're dumber than we normally would be, but I don't think we're more obedient than we normally would be. Uh, and then uh, long ago, after the wall came down, I was in Berlin going around, and there was an exhibit where they had taken street lights and they'd put banners next to the street lights, commemorating things that led up to the Nazi era. And the one that I saw had on one side a big a chess piece, and on the other side, if you read it, uh, it, it basically talked about how on this date in 1933, the Nazi party uh, passed a law making it illegal for Jews to join chess clubs. Now, chess clubs don't have a big lobby, right? And so cam- noses, camel, under tent, ball, rock rolling downhill, whatever, whatever other metaphors you want to use. So one of the things we have to really kind of watch out for and worry about is sort of the creeping, the, the things that nobody will defend up front becoming things that nobody can answer for later on, which, which did happen back then. And then the last thing I'll say in the, in the Godwin space, um, I wish this was like a safe harbor, like it was Godwin territory, but it's not. It's actually dangerous territory to talk about. Um, is that the thing that should have signaled to everybody, oh shit, we need to all like act up and stop this, was the Night of the Long Knives, when, when Hitler and the brown shirts basically killed off all their opposition. And suddenly there was nobody left. Uh, by the way, small side note, fascism is really friendly to corporations. Corporations love fascism because fascism creates cartels, it reduces competition, it kills off the labor unions, it means really high profits and guaranteed sales for corporations. So corporations adore mostly um, fascism. Um, But the moment, so in the spirit of our call, if I saw the level of violence escalate more toward the night of the long knives, I would completely change what I think I do day to day. Right now, because we don't seem to be on that path, and I don't picture Trump doing that. Maybe he can incite motorcycle gangs to do that, but I don't think so. Um, I'm interested in building the alternatives. Like, like my life energy goes up, my mojo shows up, I get happy, and I'm connected and in the flow when I'm trying to figure out 
how do we help people learn anything they want at any age with almost no money? How do we rethink how citizens get together and make decisions together and, and manage their commons? How do we get more people to understand what the hell commons even are since we've all seen, you know, we all seem to have been trained out of them, right? Consume, consume. So, so that bigger unfortunate history framing informs a lot why I think I'm doing what I'm doing day to day. Jerry, I love what you said. And, and I, I think, yeah, let's, let's veer away from the goblin territory. But I want to go through the territory of people are hurting out there. And I don't think more hate, more division actually addresses their problems. And I think this reach for, you know, make America great again, or make Poland great again, or make Italy great again, or make Britain great again, is a, an expression of that. So let's deal with that. But the problem is that being happy and trying to build stuff is really hard because there are people intentionally trying to break discourse and create fear and anger, uh, very much as was said here earlier. Like, like we are easily manipulated when we're very fearful. And that is a, it's a, it's a perfectly valid tactic, even if, if, if a hateful one. Yeah, you know, this trade war stuff right now, it, that directly benefits certain industries. Mm -hmm. And I, I was reading today in the Financial Times, they have, they've actually excluded these extended supply chains for automakers, for example. So if you look the way they're doing this, this is completely rent seeking by specific politically positioned and powerful corporations. Specific. I, I mean, I think, I think it is, I agree with you, Jerry, actually, about the, about everything that you just said, but I do also think we need to be extremely aware of the fact that, for example, Mr. Putin is, is rubbing his hands with absolute glee over everything which is happening in Europe and in the US. And there is absolute, I mean, there are more and more evidences emerging every day in the UK, just recent, just now, um, the, leave, the whole leave campaign is actually looking at five different charges of, of illegal campaigning. There's uh, billions, look like it seems like hundreds of millions at least coming from Russia into the, into the coffers of the leave campaign that no one knew about and was never properly accounted for, etc. Mm -hmm. so I don't think that this is not, this is not, um, this is not conspiracy theory stuff. This, this is a, Putin has, has long had a yeah. really significant desire to split NATO and to split apart the split apart the European Union as well. My favorite explanation of the scenario you just described, Mike, is in the documentary Hypernormalization by Adam Curtis, yeah, uh, right. where he where he describes Surkin, who is Putin's lieutenant, and that, and he basically says, "Look, we are already in a nonlinear war." That. The, the fact that we don't know whom to trust and that facts in the news system app, app, apparatus are being broken intentionally leaves us at the mercy of all the rest of these forces. And so, so um, I, the realistic, cynical part of me thinks that we are in fact in a nonlinear war. But here's, here though is, is where, here's a great example of what, of what April was talking about earlier on about actually how all of those divisions and barriers are just actually in practice completely dissolving. I, I hired a guy in the Ukraine to do some animation for my for my company, right? And it was and I hadn't heard from him for like seven, eight days. And I sent him a message finally saying, Look, do you want to do this or not? And he wrote me back a message saying, Yeah, absolutely, I want to do it because I love what you're doing. He said, But I've been volunteering at the front and I was there with my best friend replacing uh, tractor trails on an anti aircraft gun and he got shot through the head, so I had to take him back to his homeland. Jesus. Boom. Hello, Ukraine. Yeah. And this is, to, but to me, that was like, that was like, yeah, this is happening all the time, actually. With, there's nothing, actually, no matter how hard various people who want different kinds of power try, it's actually impossible to stop us talking to each other and doing shit with each other in a way which has never been possible before. And that, to me, is part of the dissolution and fluidization of nation state, which has got everyone so terrified, actually. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Well, you know, I, I don't know enough about uh, Putin to say for sure, but um, I just read Timothy Snyder's book, The Road to, uh, to Unfreedom, and uh, he makes 
a very scary and to me convincing argument that Putin since 2012, when he tried, when he stole the election that reinstalled him as president, um, has quite deliberately put Russia on a path to, um, to create some kind of weird white Christian nationalist Eurasian union. Um, and that, you know, he's re rehabilitated a bunch of obscure fascist thinkers and he's, he's, um, he thrives on, on uh, a more chaotic environment and we uh, have been vulnerable to it because our technocratic leaders told us that history was over and that we didn't have to learn the lessons of the past or even understand them. Um, uh, you know, so we may not even understand quite clearly what is the threat that we're, we're dealing with. Um, and, and, and I think there's a real danger in, myth, in underestimating the threat. Yeah. Yeah, to yeah. go back to your point about as asymmetric warfare already happening. Right, and, and yeah. also there's a real danger of not understanding what happened to you, which is, which is what I still think about liberals and the press, is that, is that they were wrestled to the ground and thrown off the stage uh, by means that they still don't quite understand. Uh, and, and the nature of power has shifted in ways that are quite fundamental and hopefully temporary. But, but the left and the press don't understand how they're sort of, well, they're beginning to suspect, but, but how they're aiding and abetting these new dynamics of power. And I think all of that is tangly and I'm not certain about the opinions I hold on it, but I think it's extremely important to understand because otherwise what we do tomorrow, the ways we respond, protest or do whatever, um, I might add fuel to these fires. Unintentionally, but, but you know, when, when, when liberals do knee-jerk liberal reactions, they're in fact fueling uh, a lot of congealing and community building on the far right. The far right's going like, yeah, we got them. We poked them in the eye again. And that's what we're looking for. We're actually not out to fix civilization. We're out to uh, provoke anger on the part of the people who we think broke this thing, right? And, and that, that's a battle, that's a sub battle that's kind of happening in the middle of all these other, uh, other scaled battles. Uh, Bill, I'm curious, um, are you seeing these things play out in any way in your local work and local community, or is this all separate from your activity? Or like, like does this fray in, penetrate into um, what you're up to? Yes, uh, in, two, in two ways. Locally, just within the last two to three weeks, we've got a group that actually operates out of our office that is developing a blockchain by city. It's called Digital Town, uh, and it's actually a public company, and, and they've chosen Miami as, I think, their second rollout city. The first, I think, was Austin. Um, but in any event, what they're trying to do is essentially what I'm hearing people talk about, in other words, create some local control. Hmm. In other words, so that at the end of the day, it may be chaos around you, in other words, in the global sense, but, it, it, but locally, you've got more control, more, more ability to create for your own community. And it's literally sort of focused on the community as, as Miami, not as Florida or Southeast Florida or whatever. In other words, it's, it's relatively localized. But it's to me, it's, it's and if you listen to the, the banter of the guy, his name is uh, Rob Monster, which is an amazing name for somebody trying. Rob Monster. Right, but he's, he's really into overstating, I would say, this class conflict. Um, this class con conflict between the rich and the poor. In other words, yeah. he gave you pictures of 500 foot yachts and, and everything, and we've got, to, we've got to stop that. And so, I mean, that's his quote motivation. But on the other hand, I'm, I was really intrigued with that article that was sent around about the, the role of mediation as opposed to other ways, because I just happened to be participating in two different um, programs by Thomas Hubel that is sort of like an international conflict resolution uh, person, and he had a 
program called Meditate and Mediate with a guy named Bill uh, William Yuri, who literally was active with the Getting to yes. Korean situation. And, and that together with this current thing called the hidden law and something called um, transformation of stress, he's really emphasizing the need for us to have a better communication so that we can at a higher level, in other words, more international level, have this sort of sense that it's possible to create cooperation, which to April's point ends up being local. And this is where I get into all my system stuff with uh, Jeremy Rifkin, where he basically is, is showing that the combination of the internet and everything is creating distributed cognition, distributed decision-making, distributed opportunities all over the place for taking it away from that middle layer. There was a thing we don't trust, government, national government, et cetera, and, and bringing it home. In other words, so that we, we, we may not be able to trust it way over there, like in Wall Street, but we can, we can trust it locally. Mm -hmm. So to me, it's a very interesting mixture because on the one hand, that sort of meditate and mediate is, is very ethereal. You know, and I find it almost sort of like unsettling to sense that I've got to rely on that. I mean, I've got no prongs to get it to, to work, but then it appears right in front of me, you know, in a blockchain structure, which if you look at things like Hashgraph, Lehman Brown, he calls his company shared worlds mm -hmm. because he's using blockchain type times. It's slightly different, but you know, this his process called Hashgraph is, is creating worlds that you can rely on, that you can trust, that it that is distributed. Okay, so it's complicated, but hell, hello, you know, that's what we're living out these days. So to me, it's a, it's a strange configuration. A, a combination of things that, that gives me at least some ability to go to sleep at night and trust that tomorrow there's going to be something around, you know, that we can work with. I love that. Thank you, Bill. You're, you just reminded me of an article I read in the last couple of days that has nothing to do with blockchain or probably even the internet, but there's a little town in Michoacan, Mexico called Chiran, which was completely under um, sort of all sorts of waves of, of corruption and gangsterism and drug cartel and political problems. And so they basically got together and kicked everybody out. They, they said, no political parties, we're not gonna join the national election, we're, we're just gonna sort of take over and become sovereign at our level. Um, and they did, and this happened back years ago, like 2011 is when this, this movement started. And they are presently sort of autonomously governing their own, uh, their own backyard. And I don't know what that means in terms of their you know, relations to other entities and all that. But they very much uh, took over uh, control over their own resources and capacities. Um, I'm happy to send some links around about uh, about this one. Once the one article was uh, uh, from the BBC, Chiran, the town that threw out police, politicians, and gangsters. From the Guardian, the Mexican indigenous community that ran politicians out of town. Anybody else with a different? Um, different angle on all this. I mean, one of the interesting nodes in my, in my brain, in my online brain, is the thought I call, uh, was 2006 peak democracy? And this idea that democracy has either been owned in different ways or corrupted in different ways or may by itself be unmanageable or maybe overrun by other methods. And what we're seeing is autocracies in other countries that are made to look like democracies. So they still hold elections, they still have courts, they still have some press, but they weaken each of the institutions to the point where it's the appearance, it, they go through the motions of a democracy, and yet in many cases, they're no longer um, democratic, if I can use that word, and think that we know what even we mean by the word democratic. Any other thoughts? Uh, Kevin, you've been spending a lot of time in, in Japan recently. Um, what do Japanese folks think about all these things happening in other places? Uh, can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Um, you may have seen the article that I sent around from uh, Tadashi Nakame, a, an economist in, uh, in Japan, a private economist at Napier Collins, uh, introduced me to. Um, 
there is a, a, a strong sense that um, um, in Japan, the, the companies themselves need to become more in tune with the other places where they do business so that there's a bit of, of internal transformation that's necessary to be more open to other places, other cultures, other ideas. Um, you know, some of that is, um, is being underscored by, um, uh, you know, the, 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 the awakening that they're going to be in the middle of the Olympics in a couple of years and the world's going to come visit, right? Uh, are, are we ready, you know, for, you know, for that visit, for people to rediscover, you know, um, you know Japan. So um, I, I think that they're, you know, kind of frothy, but again, the, you know, the multicultural aspect is, is clearly in play here because at the core of, of this is, you know, a notion that only the Japanese can be Japanese, right? And that there's no outsider that can actually understand or grok, you know, who we are. The best you can do is be strange gaijin, right? So I'm kind of, you know, there. Um, I might also say that, uh, that the Content Evolution Federation ambassador to China, um, you know, we're currently looking at, um, you know, fraying of the of supply chain and you know some active interest in some companies that have been operating on the end of of a purchase order to make things for other visible suppliers you know in the world that they're coming to the realization that they're going to have to generate their own demand um, and as a result I think that the role of, of some of those folks will be, you know, is that demand going to be in China, which is one of the largest growth markets itself, and that it will turn inward, or whether they're going to try to build demand generation and brands and, you know, try to do that on a, um, on a selected market, you know, um, multinational basis outside. I, I think that that's, now, depending on how quickly, um, you know, this tariff situation causes things to unravel, uh, you know, the, the demand will become, you know, more severe and more, more pronounced faster. So those are just a couple of observations that I would, uh, that I'd make. Thank make you. Sense? Yeah, I yeah. appreciate it. And it's interesting. I mean, it's really interesting how, how many different relationships are shaken up right now compared to two years ago. Mm -hmm. Like how, how many cages have, have effectively been rattled? How many people are having to reconsider their strategies? How many, how many people are having to make uh, contingency plans because supply chains will be disrupted because, you know, wh whatever else may be happen happening. Uh, and it's, it's all, it all seems quite real on the ground right now. It does. Um, Mika, given the conversation so far and do you want to articulate your own personal logics about what to do right now? Hmm. And I'll if any, try. Any, any, I'll anybody try. else who so wants I, to afterward, I'd like I, to hear. I, I was trying, I, I, I was reflecting on the poem that you started things with, trying to figure out uh, if, if the poem offered any uh, uh, metaphorical help. Any light on the subject, yeah. And, um, just just so, keep typing. Yeah, just yeah, keep that. Exactly. <laughs> One of us will write, write uh, Hamlet sooner or later. But watch out uh, with the monk, for the monkey with the gleam in his eye. Uh, the monkey with the gleam in his eye, he's, watch out for him. He's in charge now. Um, you know, I, I have, uh, I, I remain an optimist about our capacity to, um, you know, the resilience that, uh, that so far the United States civil society has shown in the face of uh, some very severe stresses and that, um, uh, you know, I, I, I still believe that it's possible for us to, uh, to hold the, this, this big tide at bay. Um, though I, I, you know, I, I am trying to prepare myself for the possibility that we live 
we no longer live in the world of our parents and grandparents at all, and that uh, the breaking is going to keep happening at an accelerated pace. Um, and I, I, you know, it's like Earth One or Earth Two. Which one are you in? Um, so I'm, I'm very, you know, I think a lot about the idea that this resistance has to get to be more real and stronger and be prepared for bigger shocks and be prepared to take bigger steps to try and, and, and uh, uh, prevent more bad things from happening. I don't think we can be complacent about, you know, children being ripped from their parents, for example. Um, and I think a lot of people are acting in, with that in mind compared to in other situations where maybe we were complacent or we went along. To go to Mike's point about the primitive brain, you know, the fear-driven brain, um, a lot of us are not operating, I think, from the fear-driven brain alone, where we are trying to think empathetically as well. Um, uh, and so far the worst, you know, we've, I think there's been more drag on Trumpism than, you know, him being able to come in and do everything that he wanted to do in the first hundred days. Maybe some of that is due to his incompetence. Um, but I don't, you know, I, I, I don't have many, I mean, you know, if you want to know what you should do with your money between now and November, I can give you a little answer, which is go to a website called Movement Vote, which is, is the best aggregator of dollars going to local groups that do voter registration and voter protection and voter mobilization, and they will spend the money in the best places possible. I trust them, okay? Uh, so if you're looking to just put some money somewhere and think, all right, at, at least I gave some money. And maybe, uh, you know, the, the, the other work that I find really interesting at the moment, and it's, it's really nascent, are people who are trying to use some new techniques for voter persuasion called deep canvassing, which is way more conversational and way more empathetic uh, about making people feel heard as you try and engage them to understand where they should uh, you know, come down in a particular election. We have a group here at Civic Hall, which is a bunch of liberal and progressive activists from Brooklyn who are doing this on Staten Island in a, in a swing district. Um, and you know, they're gonna have a little bit of results to show by November about, you know, were they able to change hearts and minds? I, I think we do know, I'll, I'll get you the link for Movement Vote. I think it's movementvote.org. It's movement.vote. Or maybe it's movement.vote. They, they've got a bunch of addresses. But you know, so there are, there are little tactics right now that are like, if you wanna stick your energy where it can do some marginal good in the, in the sort of fight for you know, the Democrats at least becoming a check on Trump's power by winning back one of or both houses of Congress. That's like the short term best thing you can do, I think, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, to prevent things from getting worse. You'll, there'll still be plenty of room for creative uh, uh, initiatives, even if Nancy Pelosi is the Speaker of the House. Oh, God, please. And she will not be Speaker for very long, believe me, if she even makes it as Speaker. Yeah. Um, but I'll take her over Paul Ryan any day. Good point. Um, a, a question for you, uh, before, and before going to others, who, whoever would like to sort of jump in with me, what are you doing now and why? Um, but a question which is, do you have any mental typology or taxonomy of resistance movements that are right for this context? And I ask that because there's a reason the GOP is known as the party of no, which to my own narrative is that they mounted a very effective resistance to Obama and Obama, the, the, the changes that Obama tried to bring. They basically pursued, since the Gingrich Revolution in 94, uh, the, the GOP basically pursued a scorched earth strategy to make sure that nobody talked to anybody, that nobody compromised, that everybody stayed on message. Uh, the gerrymandering meant that the Tea Party had inordinate effects on primaries and nobody cared about generals, all that kind of stuff. But, but there, was, there was a really effective ground game set up that included 
local elections everywhere at every level so that by the time Trump wins, <clears throat> one of the th statistics that blows my mind the week after is that three quarters of the state houses are Republican, three quarters of the governorships are Republican, uh, never mind president, vice president, and soon you know, Supreme Court and all that, that, that somebody had some form of resistance while not holding the office during Clinton and Obama that worked really well if you have kind of, uh, if you're willing to contemplate that a negative strategy that's probably destructive to the country worked well. And, and I realize that's not necessarily good language, but does that make sense? So from, from given that as background or history uh, or wallpaper, what, uh, what do resistance movements that might be really viable now um, look like? Because as far as I know, the left has not gotten those things done. No, and like I said, it took a long time to get this week and you don't get strong again uh, overnight. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I, the piece I wrote about Obama's failure in 2008 to continue his own grassroots movement to, is a big piece of the explanation of how Democrats lost 1,000 state house seats. There were 50,000 <laughs> people in Obama's grassroots army who said they wanted to run for office in 2009 and they wow. did nothing to support them. Wow. Nothing. That was an opportunity lost. Absolutely. Anybody else with opinions on all of this? <laughs> Rap fact. Nice title. I'm sorry. I just was checking the, the name. It's David Daly. Sorry. Okay. I mean, I do think, I think that there is going to be turmoil and I think that there's going to, and, I, and I, it wouldn't necessarily surprise me if that didn't end up happening somewhat on a global level, even more than it is at the moment. I think that the, I think when it comes down to what can we do, I think it's a question of everything we, everything that we possibly can to mitigate the amount of damage which is going to happen during this period of transition, because there is going to be damage. I just mm -hmm. have no doubt about that. But having said that, I would also say, I would also say that every story that we can tell about people actually collaborating and doing things together and winning really well through doing that is a real impact, has mm -hmm. a real impact. Every time we can tell a story about how alternatives work really well, we have an impact. Mm -hmm. It's interesting, uh, Mika a little while ago metaphorically used, can we hold the tide at bay? And I was realizing, well, gosh, we haven't talked that much about climate change and how that might play into the whole equation. And one of the interesting things that has happened is because of Trump's explicit sort of denial of removal from that process, a whole lot of other entities have jumped in. And there's a C40 Cities Initiative, and April and I had coffee with a friend of ours who's local, who's involved in C40. They're actually trying to figure out what to do in, in really compelling ways. A, a lot of employees of large corporations are becoming much more activist within their walls to steer their leadership toward more ethical decisions. We're seeing that happening. Um, so, so I'm very interested in those movements because I think that that breakage at the top might mean much more participation at other layers uh, where participation has been weaker and different. Uh, Mike, the, the chat is all saved and I will forward all of this um, and I'll publish the video on YouTube. So it'll all be there. I am glad to hear that as well because I am in the car on the way to our kid's wedding. Oh, cool. Um, but, I've, but I've enjoyed this, this conversation. Uh, I'd love to throw in just my personal take on this, um, this question of what do we do, uh, I, I think in this onslaught of actions and chaos that's being created, uh, which I think is often very intentional, um, those of us who are, have been trained to think, and even those who have been trained to think very well, can be overwhelmed by the options and the emotions that come along with the options in that thinking state and that doing state. So part of my, my own work is moving from a 
question of what do I do to who am I being? And in that being state, how do I move beyond my reactivity? Um, and how can I move more quickly into heart, mind, alignment, quick action? So if I'm drawn to give money to the people that Mika just said, to not spend time calculating about it. If I'm drawn to jumping into regenerative agriculture, uh, to take quick action. And I worry that for us so-called elites, we spend way too much time calculating. I'm sighing heavily. Nicely put, Todd. Thank you. Thank you. What's the hand motion for sighing heavily like this? I know. <laughs> Good question. <laughs> I, I think there's also this. <laughs> the universal oi. Oi. Uh, the earth scream of oi. Um, Anybody else want to jump in with what to do now and where you're coming from on it? Else I might read the poem again and take us out, but I'm, I'm happy to hear um, anyone else's take on this. We're good? All right, this has been fun. This has been uh, a, a good go around. I really appreciate um, everybody's sort of turning the soil on different parts of this question. Uh, if parts of this feel like topics for another pop-up call, uh, send me a note and we'll, we'll schedule one and come I back in. Something. I might get to talk about some of this stuff and a couple keynotes coming up. So I might reach out for more help. Excellent. Sounds good. Thanks. Please do. Thanks, April. So our poem is One of the Monkeys by Nicholas Johnson and goes thus. I'm one of the monkeys. They've got typing in a room full of monkeys. It's a play Shakespeare wrote back in the old days. They want us to write again. So we're writing a play we never read. They keep inviting strangers to watch us and the strangers say, they wrote to be or nutty to be. They stay too long if we write something exciting, but the bananas flow like wine. We know it's a crazy, morbid, ranting play, a stew full of murder, love, but with a noble feel. Shocked, I see hack monkeys come and monkeys go. One keeper killed my father. What should I do? I'm watching him. My teeth are sharp as steel. <laughs> At this point, we should just cut off the video. And, yeah. Thank you all. <laughs> oh, Bo, you have the best. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Great call. Thanks. Bye.